Just Six Numbers Written and read by Martin Rees Mathematical laws underpin the fabric of our universe, not just atoms, but galaxies, stars and people. The properties of atoms, their sizes and masses, how many different kinds there are, and the forces linking them together, determine the chemistry of our everyday world. The very existence of atoms depends on forces and particles deep inside them. The objects that astronomers study, planets, stars and galaxies, are controlled by the force of gravity. And everything takes place in the arena of an expanding universe, whose properties were imprinted into it at the time of the initial Big Bang. Science advances by discerning patterns and regularities in nature, so that more and more phenomena can be subsumed into categories and laws. Theorists aim to encapsulate the essence of the physical laws in a unified set of equations and a few numbers. This book describes six numbers that now seem specially significant. Two of them relate to the basic forces. Two fix the size and overall texture of our universe and determine whether it will continue forever, and two more fix the properties of space itself. The cosmos is so vast because there is one crucially important huge number, which I call capital N, in nature. N is equal to a billion, 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 billion. This number measures the strength of the electrical forces that hold atoms together, divided by the force of gravity between them. If N had a few less zeros, only a short-lived miniature universe could exist. No creatures could grow larger than insects, and there'd be no time for biological evolution. Another number, called E, whose value is 0.007, defines how firmly atomic nuclei bind together and how all the atoms on Earth were made. Its value controls the power from the sun and, more sensitively, how stars transmute hydrogen into all the atoms of the periodic table. Carbon and oxygen are common, whereas gold and uranium are rare because of what happens in the stars. If E were 0.006 or 0.008 instead of 0.007, we could not exist. The third cosmic number, omega, measures the amount of material in our universe, in galaxies, diffuse gas, and dark matter. Omega tells us the relative importance of gravity and expansion energy in the universe. If this ratio were too high relative to a particular critical value, the universe would have collapsed long ago. Had it been too low, no galaxies or stars would have formed. The initial expansion speed seems to have been finely tuned. Measuring the fourth number, lambda, was the biggest scientific news of 1998. An unsuspected new force, a cosmic anti-gravity, controls the expansion of our universe, even though it has no discernible effect on scales less than a billion light-years. It is destined to become ever more dominant over gravity and other forces as our universe becomes ever darker and emptier. Fortunately for us, lambda is very small. Otherwise, its effect would have stopped galaxies and stars from forming, and cosmic evolution would have been stifled before it could even begin. The seeds for all cosmic structures, stars, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies, were all imprinted in the Big Bang. The fabric of our universe depends on just one number, which I call Q, which represents the ratio of two fundamental energies. If Q were even smaller, the universe would be inert and structureless. If Q were much larger, it would be a violent place in which no stars or solar systems could survive, dominated by vast black holes. The sixth crucial number has been known for centuries, although it's now viewed in a new perspective. It is a number of spatial dimensions in our world, D, and equals three. Life couldn't exist if D were two or four. Time is a fourth dimension, but distinctively different from the others, in that it has a built-in arrow, we move only towards the future. Near black holes, though, space is so warped that light moves in circles and time can almost stand still. Furthermore, close to the time of the Big Bang and on microscopic scales, space may reveal its deepest underlying structure of all, the vibrations and harmonics of objects called superstrings, which are in a ten-dimensional space-time arena. I've highlighted these six numbers because each plays a crucial and distinctive role in our universe, and together they determine how the universe evolves and what its internal potentialities are. These numbers constitute a recipe for a universe. If any one of them were to be untuned, there'd be no stars and no life. 
Is this tuning just a brute fact, a coincidence, or is it the providence of a benign creator? I take the view that it's neither of these. An infinity of other universes may well exist where the numbers are different. Most would be stillborn or sterile. We could only have emerged, and therefore we naturally now find ourselves in a universe with the right combination. It's astonishing that an expanding universe, whose starting point is so simple that it can be specified by just a few numbers, can evolve, if these numbers are suitably tuned, into our intricately structured cosmos. Let's first set the scene by viewing these structures on all scales, from atoms up to galaxies. Start by imagining a commonplace snapshot, a man and a woman, taken from a few meters away. Then imagine the same scene from successively more remote viewpoints, each ten times further away than the previous one. The second frame shows the patch of grass on which they are reclining. The third shows they are in a public park. The fourth reveals some small buildings. The next shows a whole city, and the next but one a segment of the Earth's horizon, viewed from so high up that it is noticeably curved. Two frames further on, we encounter the entire Earth with its biosphere seeming no more than a delicate glaze and contrasting with the arid features of its moon. Three more leaps show the inner solar system, the next the entire solar system. Four frames on, a view from a few light years away, our sun looks like just one star among its neighbours. After three more frames, we see the billions of similar stars in the flat disk of our Milky Way stretching for tens of thousands of light years. Three more leaps reveal the Milky Way as a spiral galaxy, along with Andromeda. From still further, these galaxies seem just two among hundreds of others, outlying members of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. A further leap shows that the Virgo cluster is itself just one rather modest cluster. In the final frame, our galaxy would be a barely detectable smudge several billion light-years distant. The series ends there. Our horizon extends no further, but it has taken 25 leaps, each by a factor of 10, to reach the limits of our observable universe, starting with the human scale of a few metres. Now imagine a set of frames zooming inward rather than outward. From less than one metre, we see an arm. From a few centimetres, a small patch of skin. The next frames take us into the fine texture of human tissue and then into an individual cell. And then, at the limits of a powerful microscope, we probe the realm of individual molecules, long strings of proteins and the double helix of DNA. The next zoom inwards reveals individual atoms. Here the fuzziness of quantum effects comes in. There is a limit to the sharpness of the pictures we can get. No real microscope can probe within the atom where a swarm of electrons surrounds the positively charged nucleus. But substructures a hundred times smaller than atomic nuclei can be probed by studying what happens when other particles, accelerated to nearly the speed of light, are crashed into them. This is the finest detail we can directly measure. We suspect, though, that the underlying structures in nature may be superstrings, or so-called quantum foam, on scales so tiny that they'd require 17 more zooms to reveal them. Our telescopes reach out to a distance bigger than a superstring, the smallest substructure within atoms, by a 60-figure number. There would be 60 frames, of which present measurements cover 43, in our zoom lens depiction of the entire natural world. The human scale is, in a numerical sense, poised midway between the masses of atoms and the masses of stars. It would take roughly as many human bodies to make up the mass of the sun as there are atoms in each of us, between 10 to the power 28 and 10 to the 29. That's one followed by 28 or 29 zeros. But our sun is just an ordinary star in a galaxy that contains a 100 billion stars. There are at least as many galaxies in our observable universe as there are stars in a galaxy more than 10 to 78 atoms, that's one with 78 zeros after it, lie within range of our telescopes. 
living organisms are configured into layer upon layer of complex structure. Atoms are assembled into complex molecules. These react via complex pathways in every cell and indirectly lead to the entire interconnected structure that makes up a tree, an insect or a human. We straddle the cosmos and the microworld, intermediate in size between the sun, a billion meters in diameter, and a molecule at a billionth of a meter. It's no coincidence that nature attains its maximum complexity on this intermediate scale. Anything larger, if it were on a habitable planet, would be vulnerable to breakage by gravity. A universe that didn't involve large numbers could never evolve a complex hierarchy of structures. It would be dull and certainly not habitable. And there must be long time spans as well. Processes in an atom may take a millionth of a billionth of a second to be completed. And within the nucleus, things happen even faster. The complex processes that transform an embryo into blood, bone and flesh involve a succession of cell divisions coupled with differentiation, each involving thousands of intricately orchestrated regroupings of molecules. This activity never ceases as long as we eat and breathe. And our life is just one generation in humankind's evolution. Itself an episode that is just one stage in the emergence of all life. The tremendous time spans involved in evolution offer a new perspective on the question, why is our universe so big? The emergence of human life on Earth has taken four and a half billion years. Even before our sun and its planets could form, earlier stars must have transmuted pristine hydrogen into carbon, oxygen and the other atoms of the periodic table. That took about ten billion years. The size of the observable universe is roughly the distance travelled by light since the Big Bang, and so the present visible universe must be around 10 billion light years across. The very hugeness of our universe, which seems at first to signify how unimportant we are in the cosmic scheme, is actually entailed by our very existence. This isn't to say that there couldn't have been a smaller universe, only that we could not have existed in it. The expanse of cosmic space is not an extravagant superfluity. It's a consequence of the prolonged chain of events that preceded our arrival on the scene. Creatures like us require special conditions to have evolved, so the vastness of our universe shouldn't surprise us. Cosmological ideas are no longer any more fragile and evanescent than our theories about the history of the Earth. Geologists infer that the continents are drifting over the globe about as fast as your fingernails grow and that Europe and North America were joined together 200 billion years ago. We believe them, even though such vast spans of time are hard to grasp, and some key features of our cosmic environment are now underpinned by equally firm data. The empirical support for a Big Bang, the idea that everything in our universe started as a compressed fireball far hotter than the centre of the sun, is now as compelling as the evidence that geologists offer on our Earth's history. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. This is one of Einstein's best-known aphorisms, and it expresses his amazement that the laws of physics, which our minds are somehow attuned to understand, apply not just here on Earth, but also in the remotest galaxies. Newton taught us that the same force that makes atoms fall holds the moon and planets in their courses. We now know that this same force binds the galaxies, pull some stars into black holes and may eventually cause the Andromeda galaxy to collapse on top of us. Atoms in the most distant galaxies are identical to those we can study in our laboratories. All parts of the universe seem to be evolving in a similar way, as though they shared a common origin. Without this uniformity, cosmology would have got nowhere. There is a great cloud in the constellation of Orion, containing enough atoms to make 10,000 suns. Part of it is a glowing nebula, heated by bright blue stars. The rest is cold, dark and dusty. Within it are warm blobs, emitting no light, but generating heat can be picked up by telescopes fitted with infrared detectors. These blobs are destined to become stars, but are at present protostars, contracting under their own gravity. Each is encircled by a disk of gas and dust. These disks are not unexpected by astronomers. The dusty cloud in Orion, 
though denser than most of the space between the stars, is still very rarefied, and to form a star, some of this gas must contract so much that its density rises a billion, billion times. Any slight spin would be amplified during this collapse, a cosmic version of the spin-up when ice skaters pull in their arms, until centrifugal forces prevent all the material from joining the star. Surplus material will be left behind, spinning around each newly formed star, and these resultant disks are the precursors of planetary systems. Dust particles in these disks will collide frequently, sticking together to build up rocky lumps. These in turn will coalesce into larger bodies which merge to make planets. Our solar system formed in this way, from a protostellar disk. Other stars form just like our sun, and there's every reason to expect them also to be orbited by planets. Fully formed planets orbiting other stars are harder to detect than their precursor disks. A real highlight of the late 1990s was the first compelling evidence that planets are indeed common. The principle here is very simple. An observer viewing our sun from a distance of, say, 40 light years couldn't see any of the planets orbiting it, even with a telescope as large as the most powerful we have on Earth. Nevertheless, the existence of Jupiter, the heaviest planet, could be inferred by careful measurements of the sun's light. This is because the Sun and Jupiter are both pivoting around their centre of mass, the so-called barycentre of the solar system. The Sun is 1,047 times more massive than Jupiter, and the barycentre is closer by just that factor to the Sun's centre than to Jupiter's. The Sun consequently moves about 1,000 times more slowly than Jupiter does. The Sun's actual motion is more complicated because of extra wobbles induced by the other planets, but Jupiter is much the heaviest planet and exerts the dominant effect. By analysing the light of nearby stars very carefully, astronomers have detected small wobbles in their motion, which are induced by orbiting planets, just as Jupiter induces such motions in our Sun. The spectrum of starlight reveals patterns due to the distinctive colours emitted or absorbed by the various kinds of atom, carbon, sodium and so forth, that stars are made of. If a star moves away from us, its light shifts towards the red end of the spectrum, as compared with the colours emitted by the same atoms in the laboratory. This is the well-known Doppler effect. If the star is approaching, there is a shift to the blue end of the spectrum. In 1995, two astronomers, Michel Mayor and Didier Coelho, discovered that the Doppler shift in 51 Pegasi a nearby star like our Sun, was going up and down very slightly, as though it was moving in a circle, coming towards us, then going away, then coming towards us again in a regular fashion. The implied speed was about 50 metres per second. They inferred that a planet about the size of Jupiter was orbiting it, causing this star to pivot around the centre of mass of the combined system. If the invisible planet were one thousandth of the star's mass, its orbital speed will be 50 kilometres per second, a thousand times faster than a star is moving. Jeffrey Master and Paul Butler have been the champion planet hunters in the last few years. Their instruments can record wavelength shifts of less than one part in a hundred million. They can thereby measure the Doppler effect even when the speeds are only one hundred millionth of the speed of light, three metres per second, and they found evidence for planets around many stars. These inferred planets are all big ones, like Jupiter or Saturn, but this merely reflects the limited sensitivity of their measurements. An Earth-like planet, weighing a few hundred times less than Jupiter, would induce motions of only a few centimetres per second, and the Doppler shift would be only about one part in ten billion, too small to be discerned by the techniques that have discovered the bigger planets. The high hit rate of the planet seekers suggests that there are planets around a high proportion of sun-like stars in our galaxy. Among these billions of candidates, it would be astonishing if there were not many planets resembling the young Earth. Only in the last five years have we learned for sure that there are worlds in orbit around other stars. But we are still little closer to knowing whether any of them harbours anything alive. Life on Earth has occupied an immense variety of niches, 
The ecosystems near hot sulphurous outwellings in the deep ocean bed tell us that not even sunlight is essential. We still don't know how or when life got started. A torrid volcano is now more favoured than Darwin's warm little pond, but it could have happened deep underground, or even in dusty molecular clouds in space. Nor do we know what the odds were against it happening here on Earth, whether life's emergence is natural or whether it involves a chain of accidents so improbable that nothing remotely like it has happened on another planet anywhere else in our galaxy. That's why it would be crucial to detect life, even in simple and vestigial forms, elsewhere in our solar system. If life has emerged twice within our solar system, this would suggest that the entire galaxy would be teeming with life. But even if we knew that primitive life was widespread, the issue of intelligent life would still remain open. We know, at least in outline, the elaborate history and the contingencies that led to our emergence here. For a billion years, primitive organisms exhaled oxygen, transforming the young Earth's poisonous atmosphere and clearing the way for multicellular life. The fossil record tells us that a cornucopia of swimming and creeping things evolved during the Cambrian era 550 million years ago. The next 200 million years saw the greening of the land, offering a habitat for exotic fauna. Dragonflies as big as seagulls, millipedes a metre long, scorpions and amphibians. And then came the dinosaurs. They were wiped out in the most sudden and unpredictable of all extinctions. An asteroid crashed onto Earth, causing huge tidal waves and throwing up dust that darkened the sky for years. This opened the way for the line of mammalian descent that led to humans. An extraordinary procession of species, almost all now extinct, have swum, crawled and flown through our biosphere during its long history. We are the outcome of time and chance. Nothing seems to preordain the emergence of intelligence. Indeed, some leading evolutionists believe that even if simple life were widespread in the cosmos, intelligence could be exceedingly rare. We still understand far too little to assess the odds. The amazing and fascinating complexity of biological evolution and the variety of life on Earth makes us realize that everything in the inanimate world is, in comparison, simple. And this relative simplicity is a feature of the objects that astronomers study. Things are hard to understand because they are complex, not because they are big. The challenge of fully elucidating how atoms assemble themselves, here on Earth and perhaps on other worlds, into living beings intricate enough to ponder their origins, is more daunting than anything in cosmology. For just that reason, I don't think it's presumptuous to aspire to understand our large-scale universe. Just six numbers. Written and read by Martin Rees. Mathematical laws underpin the fabric of our universe, not just atoms, but galaxies, stars and people. The properties of atoms, their sizes and masses, how many different kinds there are, and the forces linking them together, determine the chemistry of our everyday world. The very existence of atoms depends on forces and particles deep inside them. The objects that astronomers study planets, stars and galaxies are controlled by the force of gravity and everything takes place in the arena of an expanding universe whose properties were imprinted into it at the time of the initial Big Bang. Science advances by discerning patterns and regularities in nature so that more and more phenomena can be subsumed into categories and laws. Theorists aim to encapsulate the essence of the physical laws in a unified set of equations and a few numbers. This book describes six numbers that now seem specially significant. Two of them relate to the basic forces. Two fix the size and overall texture of our universe and determine whether it will continue forever, and two more fix the properties of space itself. The cosmos is so vast because there is one crucially important huge number, which I call capital N in nature. N is equal to a billion, 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 billion. This number measures the strength of the electrical forces that hold atoms together, divided by the force of gravity between them. If N had a few less zeros, only a short and cosmic evolution would have been stifled before it could even begin. The seeds for all cosmic structures, 
Stars, galaxies and clusters of galaxies were all imprinted in the Big Bang. The fabric of our universe depends on just one number, which I call Q, which represents the ratio of two fundamental energies. If Q were even smaller, the universe would be inert and structureless. If Q were much larger, it would be a violent place in which no stars or solar systems could survive, dominated by vast black holes. The sixth crucial number has been known for centuries, although it's now viewed in a new perspective. It is a number of spatial dimensions in our world, D, and equals three. Life couldn't exist if D were two or four. Time is a fourth dimension, lived miniature universe could exist. No creatures could grow larger than insects, and there'd be no time for biological evolution. Another number, called E, whose value is 0.007, defines how firmly atomic nuclei bind together and how all the atoms on Earth were made. Its value controls the power from the sun and, more sensitively, how stars transmute hydrogen into all the atoms of the periodic table. Carbon and oxygen are common, whereas gold and uranium are rare because of what happens in the stars. If E were 0.006 or 0.008 instead of 0.007, we could not exist. The third cosmic number, omega, measures the amount of material in our universe, in galaxies, diffuse gas, and dark matter. Omega tells us the relative importance of gravity and expansion energy in the universe. If this ratio were too high relative to a particular critical value, the universe would have collapsed long ago. Had it been too low, no galaxies or stars would have formed. The initial expansion speed seems to have been finely tuned. Measuring the fourth number, lambda, was the biggest scientific news of 1998. An unsuspected new force, a cosmic anti-gravity, controls the expansion of our universe, even though it has no discernible effect on scales less than a billion light-years. It is destined to become ever more dominant over gravity and other forces as our universe becomes ever darker and emptier. Fortunately for us, lambda is very small. Otherwise, its effect would have stopped galaxies and stars from forming, 